Sometimes I say you will meet two people talking about Nangola and they will tell you uh, two different people. One will say, she's so quiet, she barely speaks. Another one say, that is the most talkative Namibian. <laughs> so I think when I'm comfortable, uh, I can be quite chatty. So who is Miss Nangola? Can you tell us about where you were born, when and what your community growing up looked like? No, thank you, Victoria, for speaking to me. I regard myself as a very simple person. Uh, and a simple person that I say, I'm a simple person that loves God, I love my family, and I've got a deep love and passion for this country. I was born uh, a few decades ago in a, in a very far north, in a small village called the Tomba. That's where I grew up, and I went to school in the north. And yes, I changed quite a number of schools until at the age about 15, I went in exile, ended up in Angola. Uh, and in Angola, that's where we were, a number of people, a uh, number of students that were leaving Namibia in the kind of late uh, 80s, trying to avoid uh, or to, to run away from the schools that were having uh, strikes every other day. We were in Angola for a few um, months. After that, I got a, a sponsorship through the United Nations High Commission for Refugees when we were with SWAPO. They sent me to Sierra Leone, West Africa, and that's where I completed my high school. I came back home uh, uh, for the holidays after independence, and then I came back two years later after independence to finish and complete my grade 12 distance because war broke out uh, in Sri Lanka, where, yeah, where I was living at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that must have had a huge impact on you going into exile at such a young age. What impact did that have on you? Yes, no, it, it was interesting times, and you know, when you're a teenager, uh, I think nowadays, especially when you're a mother, you forget that you're a teenager. So sometimes I deal with my teenage sons and they challenge me about a few things that I did also when I was a teenager. So when I had to make that decision, I think one thing is, I, I, now I kind of, you know, like when they say you think you, it comes to hindsight, I, the one thing I did not think about is how will my parents think? What will my family say? You are leaving them behind and at that time when you went in exile, you were gone forever. So nobody will hear from you anymore. So normally you don't think about that. So what I wanted was, I wanted the opportunity to learn, to, go, to grow, to develop, to be educated. And that's why I went in exile. So how it impacted me is yes, when you left, and the, you, you meet a lot of elders there, but definitely you have left your parents in Namibia, so you don't have parents anymore. So at age 15, there's a lot of decisions that concerning your life that you need to make and less guidance. But I think sometimes, there's a saying in the Bible that train a child in the way that they should go. And when they grow, they will not depart from it. So I think things like that have helped me because my parents were kind of strict and they were loving at the same time. So when I went in exile, I tried to apply the strictness with which they brought me up to my life so that I can still contain and look after myself in the manner that they did. So yes, one had to grow up very fast to make sure that the, the life decisions that you make will not influence you negatively in the future. In other area also is about diversity. Understanding diversity, the fact that you left a country, Namibia, where I was only part of my small family and part of my little community, and now I went somewhere else where there's people that are different from me, students coming from throughout Namibia, and then you go to Sierra Leone where people are different, they speak different languages, they have different beliefs and systems and values and morals and so on, and you kind of have to adjust and live under those conditions at the age when you are just kind of coming into teenagers, that is something that had an impact in my life, but I think it helped me take responsibility early on in my life. So many questions that I want to ask about that. Yes. But yeah. Okay. Um, so moving on to your sort of professional career. Yes. You mentioned in um, the responses that you gave us that you didn't necessarily felt feel uh, held back by being a woman in the corporate world. Um, so yeah, just speaking to that idea about not wanting to be boxed in by your gender. You know, you mentioned that you had a lot of support growing up, and that you never really felt that that was. That was a factor so can you just elaborate on that yes so i think um like i said growing up I w i'm a second born and a second born in a family where my elder uh, uh, my our first born is also a, a, a lady or a girl so the two of us that were first born we were women so i think my parents were given no choice so we were women and after us came four boys so I know, I know that my father used to to say at some point that I, I think at the time where society was still into males, my father kind of wished he had boys first 
but God dealt him with girls. But he was such an open person, and he was a, a, a kind of a liberal person. And therefore, he accepted he has got his girls, and he needs to train his girls to take responsibility. So he, is, he was a business person, and he, took, he gave us responsibility in terms of business while we were young, and in terms of family decision and family responsibility. So decision making, we were part of that. So when we grew up, he did not hold us back saying, okay, you are the girls team there so that I can work with the boys. He empowered us and he looked at us that we are the elders and therefore we must get that recognition. So when we grew up, we never looked back and felt like, no, we are girls, let us make room for the boys. So. As I grew up in my life, I've always accepted that I'm equal to anybody else. Uh, and, and I've had that security inside me. So when I started work, I think with that security of saying, I'm equal to somebody else, what a human being can do, I can do. So that did not limit me. And I say normally, I don't see what I would do, what I don't want to see, and that which I believe can limit me. So when I started to work, yes, sometimes maybe somebody says something, and you, many times ladies are under, is it because I'm a woman? Is it because of what? I tend not to ask myself that. I believe that the person is a human being. They made a mis they make mistakes. Maybe they make a mistake with a woman. Maybe they make a mistake with a male. Maybe they do whatever. That is not important. They have made a mistake. If they need to be corrected, I will correct it. If they don't need to be corrected and you kind of just need to have an oversight of that, I will have an oversight. All is important is I'm here as a professional, as a human being, to deliver, and I deliver what I need to deliver, and I ask of them to deliver what they need to deliver. And I think with that one, we kind of set the, the, the ground uh, straight, and we have got common ground and understanding of what is expected of you, in this environment, what is expected of me? As long as I don't give excuses for anything or say, okay, because I'm a mother, I was doing ABCD, or because I'm a woman, I was doing ABCD. What is expected of me, I need to know so that I can deliver on what is expected of me. So with that, I felt like I'm equal to everybody else. I'm not uh, better than somebody, and I'm not lower than somebody or, uh, or less important than somebody else, and that is what is important. Okay, thank you. You also touched in, in your response a, a little earlier, you touched on Christianity, right, your religion being a really big feature in your life. So how has that guided you uh, through life, through, through some of the dark times that you mentioned in your, in your response? Yeah, has that been a, a, a huge feature? Yeah. So, of course, as a, as, 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 as a child, I was, when I was born, my parents took me to church and they had me baptized. And then I grew up and I went in exile and I think me and God, we were not friends. So there is a few questions when you are a teenager and you ask yourself, yeah, God, if, if you are there, why, why, why are we colonized? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? Why are you allowing that one? So really good, virgin mother. So there's a few questions that you ask yourself, and in that age you kind of feel like, okay, parent, you say I'm a Christian, so yes, they give me a form, tick religion, Christianity, but I think I was not a Christian until I made the decision. Yes, I went through a dark period at the time, I lost my son, um, and, and, and he passed away on the day of our wedding anniversary, and that pain, yes, it was, it, it was quite a pain. And that pain is a pain that led me to feel that I need almost like justification for this. There must be a reason for this to happen. This pain cannot be not for nothing, and it cannot be in vain. So as part of that process, uh, we ended up going for counseling to a pastor. And that pastor just helped us to answer some of the questions of saying, why do bad things happen? And as part of that one, that is really where I think I met God and our relationship started to work. And with that one, I, I, I kind of understood, OK, maybe there is a listening that I need to have here and listen. And I look back today, and I think the person that I have, that was one of the defining moments in my life. Because at that time, I think that's when I started to understand more. I, I always grew up saying, I'm not a people's person. I don't have time for people. Uh, they are too complicated for me to understand. But then, as a Christian, I understand, love God, love your neighbor. And then I said, okay, let us explore this love, maybe the way to relate to people. I cannot run away from them. Let me find a way of getting along with them. And that helped me. So I turned around and I realized, wow, it's beautiful to work with people. It's beautiful to love people. It's beautiful to be loved by people. It's beautiful to understand them. So as part of that one, then my leadership focus changed more from just driving task, task, task to influencing people to 
making sure that I inspire people, I lead people to make a difference and to move them from one point to another point. And as that changed, I like the person I became. So yes, today I reflect and I look at that, but the pain has gotten less because I say, yes, God, I'm sure that you could have used another way to get my attention. But if that was the only way that you could get my attention, I respect and I understand that. And I uh, thank you for making sure that I could today see what has become a result of that pain that I had to go through. Somebody says once, never waste an experience, even a painful one. And I'm glad to say that that experience, even though painful, I could see something and somebody that has grown out of that experience and that can impact the lives of other people today. Uh, I've had motivation because before I left, my, my father was somebody who frequented prison a bit because of the fight for independence and liberation, my parents used to support planned combatants. So he went to jail more often than not. Uh, and, 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 and there was a time that he was like in jail for a year. So yes, although I did not read the Bible, he, was, he and my mother were an inspiration because they remained strong. So the prayer that they had to go through. So some of those challenges were not directly with me, but my parents have gone through a number of challenges in life, and those challenges were my challenges. And therefore, as a family, we knew that we come together, we pray. And my father, if I had time, he told us his stories. There is a time he worked in the farms, and then he was about to be killed in a farm, and he had to walk back home through a torture with the animals. And, and that was a whole story. And he told us how he overcame. So I think that inspiration, so it was not reading book, but his life story was almost a book. And I have this belief of saying, there's a, there's a reason why God made even my father to survive through a torture with all the animals that were there. He was in something we call Ohambo, it's farming. In those areas, farming previously during his time, is when uh, you will go to the bushes where the animals and the lions are. And he said him and his brothers would be attacked by animals, but they have to make sure that they have to kill the lions so that the lions do not kill their cattle. So he was a life example for me. Uh, and then, then, of course, my mom uh, was somebody who went to school and she overcame and became a principal um, at the time where it was. So they have got life stories and at the time things that we call a holy. My parents respect that. Every night we will sit and they will tell us, of course, their own stories and the story of other people who have conquered. And those stories, I think, have motivated me over the time to know that where they say will, they say way, and things happen for a reason. So that, as I grew up, I've always had that belief. Maybe not something of a biblical strength uh, belief myself, but something that I've taken from my parents of saying, we should persevere. It doesn't matter how dark it looks like. There is always light at the end of the tunnel. Tomorrow the day will be better. And that has really helped me to go through the darker times when I was young and I was in, when, when I was in exile. And yes, the moment I got to Sierra Leone, I got in contact with them and they would write me letters um, and, 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 and they will encourage me still. And, and therefore, I think that, bring, that, that upbringing and that support has helped me to get to where I am today.